to the second chairman's book club. It is my great honor as director of this wonderful library system to introduce the chairman of our board of trustees, Frank Hutch. Thank you, Mary Jean, and thank you all for coming. Um, this is the second of the events of the chairman's book club. And uh, I want, before I go any farther, to uh, announce what will be our third installment of the Chairman's Book Club. I'm, I'm very pleased that there seems to be uh, such interest in what I think is, is an important and uh, informative program. For March, on Friday the March the 10th, at noon, right here, uh, March of course is Women's History Month, I will be uh, turning over the gavel, as it were, to Karen King, the Executive Director of the Erie County Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, she will be hosting, she will be selecting the panelists, and she will be discussing a book called All the Single Ladies, Unmarried Women and the Rise of an Independent Nation. So if you can say that without singing the song to, in your, to yourself in your head, you're doing better than I am. Um, so please, uh, I know that that's a few months away, but Friday, March 10th, 2017 at noon, uh, Karen King will be hosting, guest hosting, and discussing All the Single Ladies by uh, Rebecca Trace. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. <laughs> but today, we have a wonderful panel. Uh, you will note that one of, the, uh, one of the panelists was unfortunately taken away by, uh, by business and couldn't be here. Uh, they send their regrets, but we, uh, we still have two absolutely wonderful panelists. I'll introduce them both right now. Uh, to my right, Linda Schneekla. Uh, most of you probably know we're Professor Emerita from UB School of Architecture and Planning, uh, an activist and uh, teacher, scholar, with uh, deep theoretical uh, work on the fundamental dynamics of professional and citizen engagement in the practice of placemaking. Linda has found many ways to reimagine and care for the place she has made her home, Buffalo, here in uh, the Niagara region. She's currently working with the Climate Justice Coalition of Western New York. She's past chair of the Sierra uh, Club Niagara Group. Her legacies include Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper and the Western New York Al uh, Environmental Alliance. She is the author or editor of six books and many articles on topics including Placemaking, the Art of Practice and Building Community with uh, Robert Shibley, Ordering Space with Karen Frank, and three bo books on regional history. To her right, Douglas Swift, principal of City View Properties LLC, Larkin Development Group, and Buffalo River Works. Douglas has earned a master's degree in architecture from UB, receiving the AIA School Medal and Certificate of Merit for graduating first in his class. He has partnered on several leading edge development projects here in downtown, including City Center, the Root Building, the Larkinate Exchange Building, and additional properties in the Emerging Larkin, emerging Larkin District, Genesee Gateway, and Buffalo Riverworks. Past president of the Roycroft Campus Corporation and a founding board member of President Preservation Buffalo Niagara. He's also past chair of a number of groups, very important, too numerous to mention. So the way we're going to be proceeding today is I'm going to turn this over to each of our panelists and I've asked them to speak approximately 15 minutes on their thoughts about today's book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life by Edward O. Wilson. Uh, and following that, uh, we will have what I'm certain will be a lively uh, question and answer period. So would all of you please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Linda Schneeklaw. be here and uh, it's a very interesting book. I welcome the opportunity to talk with you a little bit about it. Um, this is her. Yeah. Oh, now can we turn the lights down so we can see the, the slide better be? Okay. I'm going to say I've been teaching long enough to know that when the lights go down, um, people tend to get a little bit of TV, so we'll just do it for a short time. So, um, yeah, so here, here it is. This is what um, Neil Wilson is talking about, and this, of course, is where we live. This is our home. Um, this tiny little piece of rock floating through the darkness of space, um, almost um, invisible in the, in the multiverse in which we live right now. Um, and what Wilson is talking about in his half-Earth is what he says here. It's like, like it or not, 
we remain a biological species in a biological world wondrously well adapted to the peculiar conditions of the planet's former living environment, albeit tragically not this environment or the one that we are creating. For body and soul, we are the children of the Holocene, the epic that created us, yet far from well adapted to its successor, the Anthropocene. And that's the context in which he offers us. The Holocene period, you know, started about 12,000 years ago. Um, I remember having a whole group of friends that were geologists who would do things like say, they'd have a party every year and laugh and say, oh, when's the end of the Holocene going to happen? And who would have known um, that it would be happening quite so quickly? So this is, this is a very, very important image. This is a picture of the atmosphere of the Earth. Um, the atmosphere is a, it's like as thin as a skin of onion that wraps around this Earth and on which all of our life depends. Um, if you think about it, the, ter the terrestrial and the, and the aquatic landscape in which all of us live goes up a maximum of six miles and down about three miles. That's it. You know, less than 10 miles um, on the surface of the Earth, all of life depends. And this is, uh, means that it's a pretty precious, precious time. So what, I, I love E.O. Wilson, he's a scientist, right? So his book is organized by there's a problem, there's a context, and there's a solution. So we're gonna, we're gonna follow his format in this whole thing. So number one problem, of course, is climate change, climate warming. Um, we see that um, happening all over. Um, as a matter of fact, the latest piece of information that I was reading says that we have 17 years to get off of fossil fuels in order to not to pass the two degree uh, maximum increase in temperature that's been predicted as being very, very catastrophic. Um, and when people ask the question, well, how do we really know? Well, here's a little information for us. You can think about how many millions of years ago that Definitely weather's been variable, climate's been variable, no question about it. But look at what's happened um, in the last 50, 100 years. Absolute spike, totally, totally changed. Now it hasn't been this temperature for millions of years um, as an average temperature. But remember we have to tell it the difference between weather and climate, very, very important. And this I thought was an interesting graphic because it shows you what it would be if it were natural variation. You can see the line looks kind of gray, green on the bottom. That's what you probably would see, but that's not what the patterns of weather are starting to do. So this is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, it says, our guest today is Gaia, the Earth goddess. <coughs> so Gaia, what's all this like hoax, right, about climate change? And she says, well, it's no problem for me. I've been hot before, but you all are gonna have to find another planet, right? And of course, we can't, so here we are. We do even know the cause of it which is the enormous uh, transformation, energy transformation that's brought us amazing, amazing gifts. I think we should never forget that. Um, but if you think commonsensically for a second that if we're taking everything that's way down under the ground, bringing it up, burning it, and putting it in the air, how could we imagine there wouldn't be consequences? So when you kind of reduce things to common sense sometimes, um, they become much more obvious about what the problems could be. But one thing we don't think about very often is that probably close to 30% or more of global warming actually is due to modern industrial agriculture. And that's a big, big issue um, because of the food security issues that we're probably going to be facing in the near future. So problem number two, and the one that really concerns E.O. Wilson because he's a biologist, he's a guy who studies ants, right? I was just telling um, Frank that apparently he discovered a new species of ant in his office one day, which was delivered on a plant that he had in his office. So um, there are millions and millions of ants. So I remember by biomass, they're one of the biggest organisms on the earth. Um, so the laws of biodiversity is a thing that really, really concerns him. So the planet's been around, they say, for about 4.5 uh, billion years, and um, there's been life on earth for about 3.8 billion years. So this has been a very long experiment that's been going on. Um, and that all of this stuff is related to each other, all of these animals are related to each other. Here he says, um, the wildlands and, and, the, and the bulk of Earth's biodiversity protected within them are another world from the one of humanity. And we're throwing it away, pell-mell. What do we receive from this? He said, this is what we get from biodiversity. 
The stabilization of the global environment they provide and their very existence are the gifts that they give us. We are the, their stewards, not their owners. So I, I showed this map on the Great Lakes because one of the questions I'd love us to discuss during our, our discussion period is, indeed, what does this mean for us in this particular bioregion? But also, it's very critical that this Great Lakes was formed at the beginning of the Holocene, at the end of the last ice age. So our history as a region is very, very tied to the origin of the Holocene period, which was the beginning of civilization, the beginning of agriculture, beginning of industrialization, all of these things that we take for granted right now. Um, and he has a little quote about, I, I will read his quote because his language is so interesting, about North America. He says, it sometimes seems as though the remainder of American native plants and animals are under deliberate assault from everything humanity can throw at them. Leading the list of our deadly arsenal are the destruction of both wintering and breeding habitats, heavy use of pesticides, shortage of natural insects and plant food, and artificial light pollution causing errors in migratory navigation. Climate change and acidification pose newly recognized yet game-changing risks. So um, this, this sentence from the um, Bhagavad Gita says, we have become as gods destroyers of the world. That's what Oppenheimer said when we let off the first atomic bomb, uh, which one may wonder even in this day um, the ramifications of that. But as Wilson says, that we are not gods. We're not going to have a secure future if we continue to play the kind of false god who whimsically destroys the Earth's living environment. And he has a long discussion about what he calls the new environmentalists, which are the Anthropocene environments, who said, there's no place on Earth that isn't impacted by humans, so we should redesign the Earth for human beings. This is a very, very dangerous philosophy that is being purported in some circles. Because this is really where we are. We may think that we're in charge, but we're not. Then he has a lovely, lovely section on what he calls the real living world, um, which is a discussion about the sixth great extinction, which is a period that we're in right now. And he says that extinction actually, of course, has been going on since the origin of all life on Earth. Probably 99% of all species that ever lived on Earth are now extinct. So, so what's the big deal? Well, he says first extinction is called by this thing he calls HIPAA, which is habitat destruction, and climate change fits very much under that because all the habitats are changing. Invasive species, um, one has argued that human beings are perhaps the most invasive species around, um, but they're very expensive invasive species. 205 um, economic costs in the U.S. estimated 137 billion annually. Pollution, we all know about pollution, and overhunting. As a matter of fact, the loss of most of our large mammals have to do primarily uh, with poaching and the destruction, which is really unfortunate. So we're in a situation right now where you can think about the fact that Adam named the animals, remember the wonderful story, um, and we today through taxonomy have managed to name over two million plants, although they're estimating that there are like six million species um, and we have no idea what they are, and therefore we don't even know if they're being rendered extinct. So, but in a way, I think imaginally one might say is that we are now unnaming animals across the face of this earth. And by the end of this century, we are likely to lose um, at least a half of the species on this earth. Um, and we don't even know what they all do. So here's some pictures of wonderful, wonderful species um, that are under assault. Um, because of climate change or poaching. Um, amphibians particularly are very vulnerable because their um, skin's very thin and they're very, very, um, very quickly um, rendered uh, uh, extinct. You know, personally, that when I started to take students to Costa Rica um, in the late 1980s, there was a, a, a golden toad. And um, by 2000, there are no more golden toads in the, in the world, literally. Uh, but one of the things that he does, if you haven't read the book, is he goes through some really interesting dis discussions about certain species and what's happening to them. Um, very interesting ones about the ocean, for example. As a matter of fact, he talks about the deep ocean 
um, the kind of life down there we're just beginning to discover is absolutely remarkable. Um, and it also gave me hope because if indeed all the species on the face of the earth disappear, it's quite likely that those life forms will continue. So maybe life will continue, carbon-based life at some level. But I have to say one of my favorite species is the mycelium, which is this fabric and mat underneath the ground. If you dig up underneath the ground, you can find the mycelium all over the place. And it's like it's, it's how plants and trees communicate with each other. This is like the energy network or like a nerve network that's telling one plant, oh, so-and-so is being attacked by X, Y, Z. You should produce this particular um, you know, kind of, of a, a antibody or which would be some kind of a toxic material. And they actually talk to each other that way. We didn't know that for years, but we do know that now, and it's a very, very interesting thing. And every now and then, they pop up like mushrooms. As a matter of fact, I found an Aminoide phylloides in my front yard. That's called the deadly angel, a very deadly mushroom, and it was in my front yard. So I hope there are not too many of them in Buffalo. But this is an imagination. It's so interesting that when we think about when we know facts, one thing about facts is that they hit our rational mind, but somehow or another, if we can't involve our imagination in it at some level, we don't quite treat it so seriously. But this is an illustration from one of my granddaughter's books that I think is really so cool. So the solution, according to E.O. Wilson. He really bases his, his fact, or his, his belief on the fact that, you know, human beings are truly extraordinary species. We really are. Um, when you think about what's happened in the course of our, our existence on this planet, and that so much of what we do and believe in actually is constructed in our heads, in our imagination, and then we act that out in the world. And in the same time, the world acts on us. One of my favorite anthropologists is Edmund Carpenter, and he one time said, we don't know who discovered water, but we can be sure it wasn't a fish. <laughs> so we are like fish in this aqueous environment, and that we reproduce the world as we know it which is one of the reasons that climate change is so hard for us, is because it's so hard for us to imagine what actually might happen if indeed we don't address this issue. But he's saying, okay, we're in this, and this is gonna change. We know the one thing that always happens is change, in spite of the fact that we don't believe it, kind of. Um, but this power that we have to be able to reimagine something is actually the power that might allow us to proceed and to, to save the biodiversity of this Earth. His vision of the future is um, a combination of biology, robotics, and nanotechnology. He says that's where we're going, that's what our world is going to be like, um, and that we can do that, it will, as he says, the market economy will cause the, 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 our needs to shrink, it's gonna be much more efficient, energy efficient, um, we won't need so many things because we'll be able to improve the quality of life and so on. Um, we can come back to that because frankly, this looks like a nightmare to me, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but his big argument is, is that we only have one planet and one experiment, and that's why he's proposing this half Earth. Half of the Earth, he says, should be left for everything else, and human beings should retract and only allow ourselves half of the Earth to live on. He actually identifies what halves he thinks are really important, areas of serious biodiversity, um, but that this is an emergency. We need to take emergency action. But as Tiller de Chenin said, and this is in the 1950s, he said, the day is not far when humanity will realize that biologically it's forced with a choice between suicide and adoration. And right now, we're really leading toward the suicidal side. So here he is, half Earth. He says, the only hope for species still living is a human effort commensurate with the magnitude of the problem. The ongoing mass extinction of species, and with it the extinction of genes and ecosystems, ranks, ranks with pandemics, world war, and the climate changes among the deadliest threats that humanity has ever imposed upon itself. I'll say that again, imposed upon itself, right? So he ends with this notion that the biosphere doesn't belong to us, that we belong to it. And I think that this particular imagination of the Earth versus we usually talk about the balance between the economy and the ecology and equity issues. Well, we actually have it back backwards because we are totally dependent on the gifts of the earth. And that one has to be, we have to preserve that if we want to preserve ourselves. We sit inside of that and the economy 
which is made up completely, we know human beings have had many, many different economies in the course of our history, should be a, the smallest amount of influence that we have. It turns everything upside down. And I think that that's what E.O. Wilson wants us to do. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Jack. Um, thanks for coming out, everybody. It won't, it won't take anybody very long to uh, figure out which one of us is the professor in the, of, the, of the panel. Um, when I was asked to join this and, 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 and start reading the book, I sort of your question about why, why I was asked to be a part of this, because this is certainly not an area of my expertise. But, um, you know, and when I started reading it, uh, the first couple of chapters, I got really depressed. And I was thinking, you know, I gotta get through this entire book and, 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 and end up you know, with, with no hope. And uh, you know, that it was gonna be a, you know, a story of the demise of civilization. And while that's true, it, 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 it paints a picture that also does give uh, a, a significant amount of hope at the, you know, as, the, as the writing unfolds. I think what uh, Wilson did here is a, kind of sort of a masterpiece of being able to write a very scientific uh, critique of our environment and our, our history and our potential future, but at the same time you're making it very approachable for the layperson. Um, while there's just enough science into, in this uh, to, I think, uh, give uh, some real truth and veracity to um, his main points, it, uh, it makes it so that the, the, the regular person can understand and appreciate that. And while, it, while you know, we are well aware of the, 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 what we have done as a race to, the, uh, to, to our planet, um, we do see that there are some you know, potential for hopes and, and that there is a, a, a potential solutions. And you know, when I think about the you know the global scale of the problem here, it, it becomes a little bit overwhelming um, to think about what you know what it is can we do, and um, you know, I, and I've realized that that's sort of something that's kind of driven my uh, my path uh, professionally um, to a certain you know significant degree because you know they they I kind of lived under the credo of you know think globally and act locally, you know, and you know. What what are, what are we as individuals capable of doing to really um, to, to make a, a significant difference? If we're not part of the uh, global political, socioeconomic, uh, you know, cultural uh, change agents, you know, we have our our little piece of the world here that um, that is is kind of our own personal um, responsibility and playground, uh, and you know so. We, you know, how does this affect us? How, you know, how does it, you know, how does this affect uh, Buffalo, Western New York, the Great Lakes region? Um, and you know, what can we do about it? And you know, I've been very fortunate enough that I grew up and um, am still able to go to this my own little personal biosphere on the uh, Canadian Lakeshore, about 15 minutes from here. And I've spent my life there. And I woke up there this morning, and uh, I'm going to go to bed there tonight. And I. You know, spent a lifetime observing the, the natural environment around me, and I, you know, I live on this little tiny uh, gravel uh, road, which has eight ho other houses that access it, and collectively, our eight little houses um, control an, an about 40 acres of, uh, of wooded wetland that um, is then preserved almost accidentally. Uh, just by you know his, history and the, the evolution of uh, the, the development along the lake there, and um, it, you know it was something that we take a lot of uh, you know pride in, but we also don't think about it very much. And the that you know that wooded area that we drive through every day into our driveways um, was a few years ago you know selected by a local conservation group in uh, southern Ontario and who was doing an analysis of uh, the natural environment around us and they, they came to us and asked if we could come and, and, and uh, sort of you know, so, you know, a small group of volunteers who were tromping around and taking notes and, and recording the, uh, that little bit of environment and we got a letter of commendation for being such great stewards of our, of our natural environment and we all kind of looked at each other at a at our annual meeting and said, well, I don't 
film that we deserve anything, we didn't really didn't do anything. Um, which I think is the point. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a, and it's a great lesson. Um, you know, in this little spot on, along the lake, um, when I was a child, which is more decades ago than I like to remember, um, it was a very different era than what it is right now. It was the early '60s, and uh, and the 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 wasteland that our industrial heritage um, had kind of left us was at its peak. And you know, at the time, we and we recall you know wading out through the black. Um, sludge of algae, which is now considered probably blue-green toxic algae, we didn't know the difference then, um, in order to get to clear water. And, you know, and we, we thought nothing of it. You know, the, the, the stench and the, and, the, and the decay of that along everybody's uh, lakeshore there just was part of our natural environment. We, um, and uh, what I've seen in, you know, in years since then is how that has shifted, how that has changed. as, as the Great Lakes are becoming de-industrialized um, or and, and being replaced by different economies um, uh, or, or cleaner in industry and, and government regulations and uh, because of a lot of public mandates that have been uh, uh, sort of forced things <coughs> to change, there really has been change and in a very positive way. We've, 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 we've had a really positive and significant impact on cleaning up our, our local environment. And now, the, the, you know, the animal life that is around our little area there has blossomed exponentially. And you know, when I was a kid, the sighting of a blue heron landing on the beach was, one, you know, something that you know everybody called each other. There was hotlines, you know, and everybody called it, it was a blue heron. You know, it may have happened once every couple of years when somebody saw it. Now we see flocks of them, and nobody really pays that much attention. And, um, you know, just this year, for the first time, I've, I've been watching a family of eagles uh, flying around and fishing in the lakes in front of me, and, and uh, you know, and falcons and, and uh, hawks, and uh, and osprey has showed up. I didn't even know ospreys uh, were ever indigenous to this area. So you, you're seeing the you know, real physical manifestation of of how, if you really are conscious of uh, of our environment and willing to do something about it, how you can reverse a course of action. This past, uh, this past summer, um, they, I found a turtle in our swimming pool. It was a local slider uh, turtle, very, uh, very common in the wetlands, but because our wetlands wasn't so wet this summer because of the drought, uh, we, you know, there were animals that were fleeing that environment and finding water elsewhere. Um, I spent a day and a half on the phone and on the internet looking for a solution of where to put this turtle because I was afraid it wasn't going to survive well in our pool. It doesn't belong in the lake. It belongs in the in a swampy wetland, and there was none, to, you know, within walking distance of the, you know of where uh, the turtle came from. And I and I realized how the challenges that are outlined in this book um, of the sort of the natural conservations, the groups that I found were all volunteer. They had no money. They were, you know, absolutely poorly funded. Uh, there were a lot of dedicated uh, individuals, some with, with government support. But it took me hours to find anybody who knew anything about what to do, although there were plenty of groups advertised on the, um, on the internet. There was nobody there to talk to, so I left messages, and it took uh, a long time for somebody to come back. Finally got somebody, this wonderful young woman, who spent an hour with me on her Google map while I was looking at my Google map, trying to find a suitable location to return this turtle back to an environment that it could likely survive in. And um, you know, that, that too was an education, is to, to, to know and to, and to sort of look at the map of a very settled and, and, and um, uh, commercialized industrial area, which most of southern Ontario is, or at least in the areas around Fort Erie, uh, and, and to find a suitable location. Um, and found one, and we're hopeful that Yertle, which is what we named him eventually, was uh, found it found it at home. But I, you know, I'm I'm looking at this book as as both a you know as a as a, a warning signal, and, uh, but also uh, as a opportunity to sort of start a conversation of you know what do we do about this, and that the, he offers some real solutions, and it's an, it's an interesting read and. Uh, and while not being, being able to interpret a lot of the science, he, um, I was exposed to uh, uh, 
the, the magnitude of the, the challenge um, much beyond, more, way beyond what I thought I knew, even though I sort of feel sensitive to these issues. I, I realized that, that the fact that there are seven or six million dollars, six million species out there that we don't know about is uh, was a real eye opener. So I'm thinking about that. Thank you. I'll give a hand to our second panelist. We're actually doing well on time. Uh, questions? Uh, please raise your hand, and then I'm going to bring the microphone out to you. Someone? Anyone? Oh, we have one in the back. Hi, my name is Sal, and I have a question in regards to uh, some of the proposals from the book. I did not read it, however, uh, the overall environment, what concerns me is uh, about climate change is that we talk about it, we try to do something about it, but then when it comes to really doing something big on a bigger scale, especially to get officials, scientists involved, then we seem to peter out. Are we just waiting for a major catastrophic disaster that's going to blow up the earth and, and it'll be too late? What do you think? I'm afraid so past history will say that uh, it'll be too late. Maybe, maybe this would be, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this would be a good time to discuss the, uh, the Paris Accords. Uh, and I'll leave that, I'll, I'll send it over to, I guess, Linda for that. Um, as all of you likely know that they're, uh, that's our that's the sort of collective government's latest attempt to manage the uh, the the warming uh, by asking all parties to reduce their carbon output with a target of uh, of reducing the uh, uh, well I'll let you talk about it I'm trying to remember what the the, the primary goal was but Linda I'll send it over to you. Great. Um, this was a, a meeting of the United Nations, a uh, sponsored meeting, um, uh, the 21st. It was called the the, um, the parties were meeting on the tw uh, the 21st meeting, starting back all, also at the Rio de Janeiro in 1992. Um, and what this was the first time that many many people thought, and we thought as well, that something actually was going to come out of it because they were asking every nation to develop their own goals of what they could do in terms of cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then taking the making that you know public to everybody else, and it turns out that um, all the nations, over 192 nations, actually participated um, and have made a commitment to do a serious reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and there was an accountability noticing that, of course, that developed nations should be doing more because we profited from it, you know, the most. Um, and so it wasn't as Equal was not fair here. There was a recognition that many, many different people had different contributions to make, which was really critically important. And um, they, they came to this agreement, but it wasn't until April that people are, are actually signing um, the, and to that they will make the commitment they have said that they will make. Um, the United States has signed, and I'm sure you've heard that the United States and China, who are the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, have an agreement between them that they will go forward. You know, it's really easy to say, well, China's not doing it, why should we, you know, and stuff. So they're saying, okay, we're going to have to do this, we're going to have to do this together. So I think there's a clear recognition. Um, and um, apparently, I wasn't at the conference, but we had six law students from UB who actually attended the conference. Um, and said that it was absolutely fascinating. And I have to say, they kind of went over, oh yeah, yeah, right, you know. And they came back so, so enthused and committed because they said people from all over the world, you know, it's fine because in the United States we live in a very bizarre climate. Like, I mean, forgive me, climate. Very, <laughs> very bizarre place that is denying climate change. People deny it or say that it's not so important. The rest of the world is just so far ahead, it's just not even discussed, you know, and they, they came back feeling very, very positive. So that's very, very important. The problem is that the goal was um, that we couldn't raise the temperature more than two degrees centigrade, um, uh, which means that that would say put us over the tipping point. Now, of course, we don't know that because that's just projection. Those are models, right? And most of the uh, indigenous People, particularly people who live in the uh, Pacific, are arguing it can't be above 1.5 because our islands are drowning. 
There's no question about the fact that they're disappearing right now. Um, and uh, there's one island that's actually worked out a negotiation with New Zealand so that when they, you know, have to, they have the ability to move. Can you imagine trying to move your entire nation? I mean, this is what, you know, many, many people are found out. So um, we're already raised the temperature one degree centigrade. Um, and uh, so that's, we're, we're, we're really, really very close if we believe the 1.5 degree centigrade. I do want to say, if you don't mind me, just one second, that New York State is one of the states that's actually making some of the most progress with this. And the governor has uh, declared that we will be 50% renewable energy by, 20, by 2030, um, and that we will reduce our greenhouse gases by 45%. And there's a group, a coalition of nonprofits, uh, what I call environmental justice, environmental groups, et cetera, who are actually have developed legislation so that it's not just an administrative decision, but that it could actually be passed by the legislature, which would mean that there would be consequences for not doing them. I say that at the same time, which is great, but that we know that 50% by 2030 is not nearly enough. So. You know, it's like, but the notion and the strategy is, well, let's get as far as we can now, and we're going to start pushing again, because, um, you know, as you were saying, it almost feels as if we're waiting for something catastrophic to happen, as if it hasn't, <laughs> you know, um, and in order to be able to get people to really wake up and, and to think about it. As a lawyer, I was actually educated as, a, as an international human rights lawyer. One of the, uh, one of the primary things that was discussed in that context is we think of you know certain personal civil rights and all of us are very familiar with that our right to free speech our right to free assembly uh, but there is a growing movement uh, especially in the rest of the world that we should include within those basic human rights the right to have health care and the right to live in an environment that isn't poison so that these that these notions uh, that simply by virtue of your your humanity on earth, you have certain rights, not just within your person, but, but they've expanded to social and economic and even environmental rights uh, that we all have an obligation to, to protect. And that, that's, a, that's a legal discussion that's going on, has been going on just as long as we've been discussing the uh, sort of the physical attempts to, to I guess, manipulate the the economies to to reduce the uh, to reduce greenhouse gases, but I don't want to take up too much time. The next question, sir. Um, I'll ask it, uh, Linda. You reminded me of something. The, the terminology is so important. We started with global warming, and then suddenly you get a cold winter, and people say, "See, uh, it's not." Uh, and then you said there's a difference between climate and weather, and I thought I'm not sure we've made that distinction well known and, and that's part of the vocabulary the words we use climate change is includes weather my guess is but it's much more could you elaborate perhaps um yes well the weather is the thing that we see every day out there you know it comes on your phone or you can get it online or read it in the paper or whatever it's like it's the daily variations um but those daily variations happen within much larger patterns um and so what we're talking about when we're talking about climate is those larger patterns that set frameworks. So, you know, we have climate patterns right now, say a jet stream is a climate pattern. Um, and the jet stream has historically uh, held very tight up around the Arctic. And what's happening because of variations in the Pacific and around the equator, the jet stream has changing its climate patterns and dipping down more. So then we have these horrible freezing winters, right? Um, but um, but there's because the climate is changing um, that we end up with these different weather things. So weather you should think about as a daily thing that happens, but it's only framed. We don't have the kind of weather that they have in Bogota, right? I mean, because we are framed with a different climate kind of structure. So um, let's put it this way, that weather's daily and climate are the patterns, the long patterns within which other things happen. Yeah, but I think you're right. It's like people say, oh, well, you know, we, we have snow, how can it possibly be climate change? Yeah. And, but it is globally warming. And I've offered to move the mic along, so here. Great. Hi, my name is J.D. Hartman. Thanks, you guys. Um, just a little promotion. Tomorrow at Canisius College, there's a 
sustainability forum called, I think, from Rio to Buffalo, and then on Friday out at Damon, there's a sustainability forum called World on Plate. Plate. Yeah. And so anyway, um, I was kind of interested when Doug was speaking, but uh, about your personal experiences with a little patch of nature. Um, did uh, Yo Wilson make any suggestions of what we can do on my, you know, at my own personal little scale? I mean, if the Earth is a dot floating through the darkness of space, I don't know what I am. So anyway, you know, what what role can I play other than going to countless meetings where I'm at one time kind of depressed and then I'm encouraged and then I'm depressed and I'm encouraged and then <laughs> I jump in my car and I Welcome turn to the human race. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I actually don't re recall much in the way of, of what uh, in the book itself about you know what one person can do because the, you know, because the magnitude of the, the, the situation is so grand and he's really calling for sort of wholesale global change uh, and that's that's, that's asking a lot of humanity to do that in any kind of time frame that it will be will have an impact. Um, so you know I you know I, I don't I don't see that in the book. Linda Linda didn't recall anything. And, but um, you know, I I do have you know I I'm a I tend to be a glass half full and, and uh, rose colored glasses kind of guy. You know, I, I I believed in Buffalo Renaissance 30 years ago and that took a lot of willpower. Um, and uh, you know, but now it's happening. You know, but it's a generational thing, and everybody thinks it just started uh, a couple of years ago. And the, you know, the reality is, it started two generations ago when Bethlehem Steel shut down, which was both the best news and the worst news for that Buffalo could have simultaneously. You know, the worst news is it put thirty thousand people out of out of work overnight. The good news is that it began our environmental. Uh, and, Cleanup efforts, just you know, by you know, the mere fact that all of that um, energy wasn't being expended, um, polluting our environment. So you know, I, I look at, at what's happening today. I look at my own kids who are in the millennial generation, who I don't understand, but I'm also incredibly proud of because I you know I see them you know really taking this fight on you know you know head on. And wanting to see, you know, sort of make a difference, and I, and you know, the one point that uh, that Wilson made that relative to that is, you know, the, the good news about sort of the global development that's going on is that the more developed countries get, the the, the lower the population growth becomes, because you know, having babies isn't the only uh, way we spend our time, and they're because they're, they're so that therefore you're putting less pressure. Uh, you know, I think U.S. and many other developed countries are already below the zero population growth uh, demand. And personally, I didn't have 2.4 children; I had two, so I'm I'm below the you know. And I think I think more and more, and as you see, you know, kids these days, you know, having you know, getting married and having families isn't the priority it was generations ago. And so, if you if you really want to look at the long term, uh, assuming we have enough time to do that, and I believe. That the, the, that the populations, you know, globally, you know, start to, to decline by choice, and the the demands uh, on the environment become less as a result. In, in ideally, technology, you know, kind of gets to a point where you you're, you're not putting the same kind of demands, even for the same amount of output, um, uh, uh, on the environment. So you know, there's, there is a way. To, there is a possibility of reversing it. We're in dire straits right now. But to the other question about is it too late, and you know, can we expect us to make a change? The reality is we don't put up a crossing guard at the railroad tracks until somebody gets hit, and that's kind of a, that's kind of our human nature. We have to find a way to reverse that, and I and I think the fact that the the, the world is coming together and, and agreeing uh, to the problem and signing on to solutions is a, is a tremendous first step. A generation ago, that wasn't possible. You know, it's happening now. The next generation, I think, will do better, and so on. Yeah. Just briefly, uh, I think we have to also recognize that the, the the American economy, at least those of us in North America, despite the fact that we have five percent of the population, we take up thirty percent of the resources, and it a lot of that is the function of our mass consumption, mass production, uh, economic society. Uh, it, 
it's given us tremendous benefits, but it's caused tremendous harm. Uh, and we need to sort of fundamentally change that. Uh, as long as we, as long as we are the world's largest producer of, of garbage, uh, we haven't fundamentally changed our economy in a way that that reduces greenhouse gases in any any sort of meaningful way, and that's a difficult thing to change for everybody. So I think of the old Gandhi, "Be the change that you want to have." So, you know, I, I, it sounds trite, but I mean, as he suggested, think think globally and act locally. Just try to reduce our carbon footprints. Do we need to have huge houses? Do we need to have huge cars? Do we need to, uh, you know, constantly live in a, in a society uh, fueled by mass consumption? Obviously, you, you inspired something. I thought, I'm not as optimistic, um, partly because I think that, um, you know, being steeped in this stuff and getting back all of the data and stuff, it says that we cannot actually take another ounce of oil and gas out of the ground um, if we believe that we actually are going to stop at two degrees. Um, it's a recent article by Bill McKibben that you might want to look at um, that actually does the math again and shows that that's the case. So then what do we do? It's like, I'm not unhopeful, which is a very different way from being optimistic, because it's always possible that something will happen. You know, the fact that it's not, it's not a closed system yet means that things are open. But I also think that this generation, those of us who are grown-ups today, especially my generation, have enormous work to do in responsibility because we benefited the most from this lifestyle thing that we got the most in so many ways. And I wish that every old person would be standing up and marching to Albany and saying, enough, we're not gonna do this. Going out the Standing Rock against that pipeline and saying, no, you're not gonna build this pipeline and more gas infrastructure because we have to stop and use that money for renewable energy right now. We can do it. We have the finances and we have the technology to make a shift in the next 10 years if we decided to take a warlike effort to the way that we think about this stuff. We could switch the electricity sector within 10 years because both wind and solar are very, very quick to get up once you get started. It's not like a huge, huge effort. And um, I encourage all of you to write to the governor at least once a week, tell him to get going with this stuff, renewable energy. He just, he just allocated $7 billion to the nuclear industry. You know, those of us who live within 30 miles of West Valley say, this is crazy. We don't need any more waste, you know, which is, of course, what we do when we get nuclear energy. So, because we can do it. You know, that um, there's a guy, Mark Jacobson, who's at Stanford, who's done some great writing on this that I encourage people to look at. Or he's had other that other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. First thing. Jerry, um, in the book, in Chapter 15, Mr. Wilson puts forth the idea that we should put aside about two dozen special areas that are pristine. And the first part of the question is, is he specializing in these areas? Is he prejudiced towards these areas because they are more underdeveloped? The people in them are poor. They'd be easier to move out. And it, once again, it would be the rich finding a way to prejudice the solution of a problem against the poor. And the second of, of all is, does he think he can actually get away with doing this? I mean, a couple of these, these regions, are entire nations, like Bhutan or Myanmar, you're gonna wipe out an entire nation? Is this, this a realistic solution to the problem? Let me, I, I think those are really good questions because we have every right to be suspicious when those of us in the developed rich world make our eyes on places in the rest of the world. But he, that, that's not the reason these places were selected. They were selected because a whole group of biologists have said these are the most biodiverse, most genetically diverse areas on the earth. And they happen to be in areas not in the temperate forest, but in the tropical uh, areas for the, for the most part. So I think that that's, that was science, quote unquote, that was used. And I also don't think he's saying that you can't have humans live in them um, you know, that you sort of clear them out. Um, I think rather the question would be is like, if we thought that this was a reasonable proposal, how do we look at Western New York and say, okay, 50% is for wilderness. Well, for one thing, we wouldn't build housing on the outer harbor, right? Yeah. Um, so, so just look at everywhere and say, 
here, okay, then we want to put more people in the city of Buffalo because we want to stop this greenfield stuff on the outside. We could develop a whole policy that said half Niagara and say, let's just look at our own region and see how we could do that. Because we could. We could do that. We could set policies in place. We could actually enforce sprawl, um, anti-sprawl legislation. We could do all of that stuff if we as a people stood up and said, and frankly, unless we as a people stand up and say, all of this stuff, it's not gonna happen. Not only can we, other, other communities have, thinking of Portland, Oregon, doing so has increased the, uh, the property values and increased their economy. So, all, and, and disinvesting in fossil fuels may sound you know, sort of like a pipe dream, but it's, it's frankly a very good economic idea because by investing now in what will be the future of energy production, uh, we, would, we would be helping our own economy greatly. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I agree with Linda. I don't think that they chose any of these sites uh, for, for any, any, anybody's benefit. I think, you know, he really did it, went about it, I think somewhat very scientifically by getting the expert's opinion on what's the most, would have the biggest impact. You know, how, how I don't think he's, he's not a political scientist. He's not, he, he, he didn't delve into uh, whether or not the, you know, that politically or, or culturally or economically and, you know, those things could happen. I think he was sort of complaining what could happen. But if you fly around this planet uh, uh, at all and you look out your window on a clear day, it's hard, it, it's really hard to pick out how man has impacted the planet. You can't really see it from, uh, from 30,000 feet and, and through vast stretches. So. Those places are there, but you know, in, you know, I, it's hard to sort of grasp what we can do in Madagascar when we're, you know, when, when we're here in Western New York, and, and you know, again, it's like, what can we do here? Um, and I think what's happening, uh, you know, culturally and economically in the city is a is a prime example of how we can reverse things. And the big houses that every that were for for a generation were being built in the suburbs are going years unsold or at drastically reduced prices. The demand just isn't there anymore. The, you know, the demand for, the, for inner city housing is, is ever increasing. You know, that is a recent phenomenon in the city. I think that you know, as we shift into concentrating the development into, you know, back into sort of more metropolitan, denser uh, uh, um, cities, it'll free up the pressure on a lot of the natural environment that can, uh, can, can start to regenerate itself. Time for one more question. <coughs> oh boy. Sure, just one. <laughs> I saw this hand first, so I'm going to go with that. We're, we're going to end it one formally, but that doesn't mean everybody can't hang around after. To ask questions, go ahead. My name is Janet, and the first thing that occurs to me that um, is, unless we can get money out of politics, we will be controlled by the money that is paid to our elected officials so that they can be reelected. So I think that's where our focus should be. If we want to get a handle on the legislature and have them concentrate on the environment. Right now, the money is buying their legislation. Thank you. You're suggesting there's some sort of connection between money interests and politics? <laughs> shocked. You're shocked? <laughs> Gambling at risk? One more question. Ah, OK. My name is Jean, um, uh, and I just wanted to add something to what everybody else was saying about, uh, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning, it was unavoidable, um, about things that we can do around here. Um, there are all these pipelines that um, the uh, fracking industry is trying to build, and one of them they want to put right through western New York. It's called the Northern Access 2016 Pipeline. National Fuel is already um, trying to bamboozle people into selling their land and uh, pressuring people, telling them if you don't sell it to us now at, a, at the price that we suggest, then we're going to get eminent domain and then we're going to take it from you whether you like it or not. And they're, um, in the meantime, they're threatening to, well, they're planning, not just threatening, they're planning to increase the size of the, the compressor station in Elma that compressor station now is 600 horsepower. They want to go up to over 5,000 horsepower. And they've already had 
a lot of problems with it, leakage of gases, you know, volatile organic compounds. There's, um, they've also had, they have um, regular um, blowdowns, which are very noisy and release a lot of uh, toxic gases into the atmosphere. And they already, uh, one woman told me that um, in the 30 years she's been there, yeah, we've had a few scares, but we've only had one evacuation. Well, nobody should be, have to evacuate because of their neighbors, you know, uh, blowing things up. That's not, not what I would say it was acceptable in Elma or in Buffalo or in Wheatfield or what, what, all the different places that they plan to go through, Hinsdale, Wales, uh, Colden, anyway. So I just thought, in any case, um, there's plenty of things that we can all do to try and stop this. Number one, call the governor and tell him to please deny the DEC permit to the to this pipeline. It's called Northern Access Pipeline 2016. Thank you, Dean. That's very, very, very important. And I, I will, I want to just say a few things that are going on right now that you might want to participate in. If you visit the Sierra Club, Niagara Sierra Club website, there's actually a whole series of campaigns about bomb trains and about the pipelines and about um, the Outer Harbor, all kinds of places if you want to get involved because, you know, community action is going to be really, really critical. But um, this weekend is an amazing um, conference that happens every year. It's called World on Your Plate. It's about food. And Francis LePay, who wrote the book Diet for a Small Planet, is going to be speaking at uh, Gaiman College this weekend um, on Saturday. But the conference is Friday and Saturday. So please look into that. On uh, Monday, which is uh, Columbus Day, uh, there's going to be a gathering of Native peoples on Unity Island, formerly known as Squaw Island. Um, and stand in solidarity with uh, people at Standing Rock, who is also trying to stop another pipeline. And then next Saturday, the Sierra Club is having their annual dinner. It's going to be at the Temple Beth Zion. And Aaron Mayer, who is the president of the uh, Sierra Club, the National Sierra Club, is going to be speaking on issues of climate justice. We talk about climate change, but it doesn't affect all of us the same. And uh, you think about people who live in a house that's drafty, uh, that you couldn't put solar on the roof if you tried, that has to spend 40% of their income on just keeping the heat on in their house, that's not just, that's not fair. Um, and certainly isn't fair to future generations. So he's going to be speaking about climate justice. So a number of things going on. Please keep track of it. Participate. Become one of the, what I call, you know, climate change warriors. Let's go out and let's just make sure that we save this planet and save these species for the next generation. Thank you. And then let's add to add um, and urge everybody to get involved and support uh, Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper. Yeah. I mean, they are really, uh, have got the, the best organized uh, group that is getting international recognition now for the great work that they're doing. And uh, you know, while their, their name is Riverkeeper, their, their involvement it goes much deeper than that. And, uh, and they're looking at the entire region, and, and really the whole Great Lakes Basin is really their, their arena. So that they, they're doing wonderful things. There's a project that, that I've working, been working on uh, with a few groups, uh, including uh, that are sort of being involved through the Western New York Environmental Alliance, that uh, over the next year there'll be a study looking at uh, actually building a facility that could, that could co-house multiple environmentally focused uh, organizations, including Riverkeeper. Uh, that would become a think tank, a, a resource, an, you know, an access point, and, and really put, uh, put our region uh, on the map of being really forward thinking in, in how, to, uh, how to make real change. Thank you to our wonderful, wonderful staff for, for putting this together. And then let's give one more hand to our wonderful panel. <laughs> That's our time. Uh, we have an hour. Remember, Friday, March 10th, right here. Uh, all the single ladies, unmarried women, and the rise of an independent nation will be hosted by Karen King, the executive director of the Erie County Commission on the Status of Women. More information on the panel uh, and uh, other things to be coming out soon. Thank you all for coming today. <laughs>